Hello, friends, and welcome back to Inspire Ministries. I am so happy that you are here today. I'm happy that you've landed on this video, and I am hoping that it will be of encouragement to you today. Listen, today I just have a word of encouragement to you, uh, something that I found in my quiet time actually in the last week and uh, some connect the dots moments that happened for me. And I'm hoping that I can just share with you and that you will um, benefit from the encouragement today. Uh, so I am going to be reading two sections of scripture. Um, and both of these areas of scripture are places that I have been in the course of the last, I would say, six months. I believe that um, God has had me on this journey and um, journey through prayer and journey through the Bible. And it has been absolutely amazing to see some of the places where I have landed. Um, and I'm going to be, like I said, in two different areas of scripture today, and I want to show the connection to the two verses, and I'm hoping that it will also be of encouragement to you. And I want to start out all of this by saying this one line that I want you to remember until the end of this video, and that is this line, there is still work to be done. So I want to take you to the book of Ezra. If you are not familiar with the book of Ezra, basically, if you go to Psalms, which is in the middle of your Bible, and you take a couple left turns, it's right before the book of Nehemiah, which is right before Job, which is right before Psalms. So um, the book of Ezra is a very unique uh, book. If you're not familiar with Ezra, Ezra was a scribe, and he was kind of called to the Israelite people to um, tell them about their sin, to make them aware of the areas that they had strayed away from God. And the whole entire purpose was for Ezra to um, get them to see the error of their ways, get them to see kind of the circumstances that were creating this gap between them and the Lord and to restore the people back to the heart of God. And so Ezra the scribe is a very unique uh, character, and we read about him in this little book that only takes up 10 chapters. Um, and if there is a book that you would like to read from the Old Testament that is almost from start to finish prophetic in nature for what it is that we are experiencing as a nation today, it is the book of Ezra. Um, I have actually many books that I would recommend that you read in the Old Testament when it comes to minor prophets and Old Testament um, books, but this is definitely one of them. Um, and I wanna read to you today from Ezra chapter nine. So if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to take it out and just read along with me. I'm gonna read several verses and then I'm gonna talk through and pause in different sections of the scripture. Um, all right, so we're gonna start out in Ezra, Nine And what is going on here is that um, Ezra basically intercedes for this these holy people. He intercedes on behalf of the Israelites who had strayed away from God. He had gotten news that what was happening was sin running rampant in the nation. Um, in fact, verse 1 says um, that when these things had been done, the Jewish leaders came to me, He's speaking in first person here. So he says, they came to me um, and he says, many people of, of Israel and even some of the priests and Levites have not kept themselves separate from the people living in the land. They, they start talking about um, intermixing marriages. They started talking about all of the sin that was running rampant and Ezra was devastated. And um, you can really feel that in this chapter, that Ezra felt the weight of what was going on in his nation with his people. You could feel the weight of their sin upon his life. Um, Ezra almost carries it as though he were responsible for it himself and as though it were on his shoulders. And so um, it's, it tells us that um, in verse, uh, let me see where we're at, in verse two, it says, so the holy race has become polluted by mixed marriages. Worse yet, the leaders and the officials have led 
the way in this outrage. And so it wasn't just the people who were be behaving erratically and being sinful, but it was also the priests and the leaders who were as well. And I don't know what was it that, that devastated Ezra more that they were being sinful in nature, period, or that they were actually being led there by the priests and the leaders of their day. Um, so then it says in verse three, he says, when I heard this, I tore my cloak and my shirt, I pulled my hair from my head and my beard, and I sat in utter shock. Verse four says that, then all trembled at the words of God of Israel, came and sat with me because of this outrage committed by the returned exiles. He says, then, as I sat there utterly appalled, I sat there until the evening sacrifice. And verse five is where I wanna pick up this story. He says this, at the time of the sacrifice, I stood up from where I had been sitting mourning with my clothes torn. I fell to my knees, I lifted up my hands to the Lord God and I prayed. And we see the prayer go all the way from verse 16 to 15. And I'm not gonna read all of it, but I wanna read some of it. At the very beginning, it says, Oh my Lord, I am utterly ashamed. I blush to lift my face to you for our sins, our sins. So he's taking personal responsibility for the sins that are happening to his people. He said, for our sins are piled higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, we have been steeped in sin. That is why we and our kings and our priests have been at the mercy of pagan kings in the land. He goes on to say in verse 8, he says, but now we have been given. He recognizes. He says, now we have been given this brief moment of grace. For the Lord our God have, has allowed a few of us to be saved as a remnant, as a remnant. He has given us, he says, security in this holy place. Our God has brightened our eyes and granted us some relief from our slavery. So we see here that he is devastated. He's absolutely devastated. He's mourning for the sins that he has seen, witnessed by his people. He is now recognizing that he needs to take ownership in that as well. And in addition to that, he is recognizing that the Lord has given them this brief moment of grace, this brief moment where this remnant, which is the ones that will be left over when all of the dust settles, this remnant of people have been given this amount of time to be given grace. Now, the place that I want to uh, focus in today is the line in verse five that says, at the time of sacrifice, so this was the evening sacrifice. This would have been a ritualistic thing that was done that an evening sacrifice would have been given to God. And he said, at the time of sacrifice, he did three things. If you take notes and you want to write these down as bullet points, this is an excellent example of prayer in this section of scripture. He says, I stood up from where I had been mourning. He says, I um, fell to my knees and I lifted up my hands to, to my God and I prayed. Beautiful thing that we see. He was in mourning. He had just gotten word that, you know what? Your people have sinned. Your people have disgraced the Lord. Your people have dishonored God. And Ezra felt the weight of that on himself. And he took it upon himself actually personally. And he says, and it says, I stood up, I fell to my knees, I lifted my hands and I prayed. What a beautiful response. It's like he was down and out. He was suffering from being so overcome from the sin that his people were involved in. He was so encompassed by this agony that he had for his people in the sinful way that they were dishonoring God. And he was mourning. And it was like in this second, in this verse five that we see, in this moment, he transfers all of that 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 disgrace and all of that sadness and all of that overwhelming sorrow. And he says, I'm gonna do something about it. 
I am going to pray on behalf of my people. I'm going to admit the sin that we have been steeped in. I'm going to take on the shame and the guilt for my people. I'm going to recognize that the Lord still has great things planned for this nation, the nation that he has called to himself, the nation that he loves. And I am going to stand up. I'm going to fall to my knees. I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to pray. It was as though what was taking place in Ezra right there was a mini revival. I want to show you something else where this kind of behavior pattern is, exam is given as another example and exemplified in the life of Joshua. I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 7. Now this is the way that the Lord often speaks to me. He will give me a little snippet, a little short snippet of something, a little bit of a story. And he won't show me the full picture, but I'll get this little bit, this little portion of the story. And it will stay in my memory bank. It was, it's like I, I, I resonate with it, I look at it, I dwell upon it, I read it a lot, I study it down. And then it's like I still can't get it out of my memory. It's still kind of there hanging and sometimes weeks, but sometimes months later, I'll come across something that will be almost exactly like that same situation I had already read and studied about, and God will make those uh, dots connect, and I absolutely love that. So several months ago, I had studied through the book of Joshua, and I was in chapter 7, and I had remembered when I, when I read that in Ezra, I was reminded that this same thing happened to Joshua. Now, if you are familiar with Joshua, Joshua was the fighter, and he was the one who would take the Israelites into the promised land. And he had a great call on his life. He had a significant role to play in the life of the Israelites. And they had given, they had been given all kinds of victory over their enemies. They had been given victory after victory after victory because of course they were led now by actually a warrior. And so in chapter seven, we see that what has happened is there was a strict order by God that when they took when they, when they had victory over a specific area, they were not to take anything that was to be set apart for the Lord. They were not supposed to take anything, anything. They were not supposed to keep anything that was to be separated or set apart for the purposes of God. But what we saw is that there was one man who actually violated those instructions and Israel was now going to pay a price for that disobedience. We can see it in verse one, it says, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. And, the, and it happened from a man named Achan. Achan had stolen some things that were dedicated to the Lord and the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. And so what happens is there is this, um, there is this, this battle that is, is ensuing and, um, it's a very, what should have been for the Israelites, a shoe-in win. It should have been a shoe-in victory for them, no problem. And so actually they say, we're not even gonna send all of our guys in to, to fight this one. We're only gonna send 3,000 of our troops. And because, you know, we know that we are gonna have victory here because we've given, you know, the Lord has given us victory so many other times before. This is a small battle. And so we're not gonna even give it much thought. We know that we're gonna have victory. So just send those guys and we'll be on our way. But what, what happens is the Lord actually um, allows this other, this other army to defeat them. And so um, Joshua's confused. He's like, you know what? You've given us victory over after victory after victory. I know that I have been called to these people for a purpose. And now what we're seeing is that you have allowed them to defeat us. A, 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 you know, band of guys that should not have defeated us. It should have been an easy win for us. And so we pick up the story uh, in Joshua um, chapter seven, verse six, and it says, Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay. Sound familiar with Ezra? They tore their clothing, clothing in dismay. They threw dust on their heads and they bowed their face to the ground before the Lord. And then Joshua steps out because as the leader, that's what you do, he steps out and he cries, Sovereign Lord, why did you bring us here? 
Why did you bring us across this Jordan River if all you were going to do is let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been to, if we had been content to stay on the other side, what can we do now? And, and it sounds as though he is He's fighting with the Lord. It sounds as though he is saying, you know what, you've made a mistake. But listen, at the end of verse 9, he says, um, he's talking about like, like what's going to happen of us, to us now? Like, what are they going to do? Wipe us entirely out? Like, you can see some fear, some actual real fear in Joshua at this point. But then he says, and then what will happen to the honor of your great name? So in other words, he's like, I, I know that like we have reason to fear, but what the ultimate fear is, is that your name is going to be disgraced. Your name is going to be dishonored. So in verse 10, it says, but the Lord said to Joshua, get up. He just says, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? And I got to tell you, when I landed on this verse, I was like, oh, wow. Like, it was as though the Lord was saying, Wendy, get up. Like, why are, you, why are you laying on your face like that? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know what I have called you to? Don't you know that there is still work to be done? And so he goes on to say, Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen the things that I have asked to be set apart for me, and they haven't done it, done the things that I have wanted them to do right. They have continued to sin. And then he repeats himself in verse 13. He says, get up. Get up, Joshua, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord of God of Israel said. He said, hidden among you are treasures that the Lord has set apart for myself, that I have set apart. And, and he says, he goes on to say, he said, these are the things that are to be set apart from the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove those things from among you. You will never go to the places that I have for you and that I have for the people as long as there is uncleanliness among you, as long as there is even one person that is doing something that they were told not to do. In disobedience, they, they, they will not allow, I will not allow for there to be a continuation. You have to tell the people to purify themselves. And so I want to say this to you today. There's still work to be done. There is still work to be done. I, I think about these areas of scripture and I think about how, how easy it would be for you and I to get defeated. Now, I don't know if you are anything like me, I can get defeated in a heartbeat. Listen, if I'm being honest, just the recording of this video alone almost led me to go, yeah, I'm not fit for this, I'm not doing this, I'm, cut, I'm not cut out for this, I'm quitting. But this is the real story. The real story is God has called you for a purpose, he's called you for a plan, he's called you for such a time as this. And what he's telling us today is the same thing that he told Joshua, it's the same thing that he told Ezra, don't you know who I, I've created you to be? Don't you know that there is still work to be done? If you're familiar with the story of Elisha, you might remember that after he had great success on Mount Carmel, after he had saw the Lord actually defeat the enemy right in front of his eyes, greatest victory of his life, we see that he is running to a cave. Why? Because the king's wife found out what he had done and she was after him to try to kill him. And the Lord finds him in this cave. And the Lord says to him twice, not just once, but twice, he says, Elisha, what are you doing here? In fact, the second time that he asks him, and this is found in 1 Kings 19, the second time the Lord asks him, he says it in a whisper. Scripture tells us that he, his voice was like that of a whisper. And it was like he leaned into Elisha and he said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? There is so much more work for you to do. He says the same thing to Joshua, get up. Like, I know you're sad and I know that you're upset because of the situation that, that's at hand. And I know that you can't trace my hand because one moment I gave you victory and the next I gave you defeat. But the thing is that you still have work to do. He says the same thing to Ezra. He says, you know what? You don't have to take full responsibility for what is happening here, but while you're mourning, I need you to get up and I need you to 
purify yourself and I need you to pray like never before and I need you to worship me with your hands up and fall to your knees. And it was in that moment that Ezra realized, listen, there's still so much work that God is doing. There's still so much work that he wants to do and there's still so much work that I am called to do. And so I want to give that to you as an encouragement today. I would love for you to um, read those chapters for yourself and get out some, there's just such amazing nuggets all throughout Ezra 9 and Joshua 7 that can be uh, read by us and, and really um, get it down into your into the marrow of your bone to understand that there is still work to be done and, and, and really it reminds me of the situation that we are in as a nation right now you know it's very easy for us to turn on the news or to look at what's happening all around us and to be discouraged and to be depressed and to mourn for the things that we see, mourn for the losses that we've endured, mourn for all of the all of the ways that we are seeing just crazy things break out all over the world. But here is the bottom line: there is still work to be done. In fact, there has never been a time in I believe in the history of the world where there's ever been this amount of work that needs to be done, where souls are are needing to be rescued, where lives are needed needing to be touched by people that need to be encouraged. And so I just want to encourage you today, um, if you feel like that is you and you feel like you are in that place where it's like, you know what, God couldn't use me. You know what, I'm just sad at what I see and I'm just going to wallow in my self-pity. I want you to be encouraged today to get up, to get up, to um, stand upright, to be brave enough to go in and do the work that he has called you to do, to do the work that only you can do. So I hope that has encouraged you today. If you have liked this video, if you would just hit the like button, I would absolutely appreciate that. If you wanna subscribe, I would love for you to subscribe. Hit that notification bell if you want updated on further content, and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.